Great relationships don't just happen. They're designed. Why leave love to chance when you can make strategic decisions in your relationship just like you do in your career? The days of settling for mediocre are over. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the decisions and choices that make relationships work no matter what life throws your way. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to Project Relationship. Hi, and welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. I'm Ken Hamilton. And we are talking on episode 16, which is in season two already. Hooray! Yeah, season two, yeah. Um, we're talking about ethical non-monogamies. Um, polyamory is usually what we call our particular um, version <laughs> of it. Um, we're talking about agreements today. We have just done a couple of episodes on um, the what and the why of ethical non-monogamies, like a little bit, a little bit of background and a little bit of our personal why we do this. And then we talked a little bit about intimacy and what the heck the word intimate even means. But is, that's a complicated <laughs> one. Yeah. So every time I ever talk, um, I have talked on panels, I've talked at large conferences, I've written about this. Um, I've taught classes on it. Every time I talk about consensual non-monogamy is of any kind, the question of rules comes up. Now, it also comes yeah. up, you know, anytime you have a dating profile of any kind. Um, I have found that I wind up with a whole bunch of people who are not interested in dating me so much as asking, what the heck are the rules for that? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I think the easiest way to start off is to say that the, the shift from... Um, practicing monogamy to practicing polyamory has been the shift of imagination that let me, when I was practicing monogamy, I imagined that there was a set of rules that could protect me from being hurt. I imagined. It. I'm saying right. I imagined because it, it turned out that, I mean. That's not what rules do. I got hurt plenty. Yeah. And it, the rules weren't going to protect me from that any more than a law by itself can protect you. We just watched Crip Camp. I was refreshing for a class that I'm teaching, which if you haven't seen Crip Camp, the Definitely documentary, Crip Camp. get on Netflix and watch it. It's actually um, because of how it was produced. It's also available full length on YouTube. Go watch Crip Camp. Everybody should watch it. It's amazing. But we were watching that and I was just thinking about the laws and how you can have a law in place. But if there's no clarity around how that law will be enforced, it's pointless it's just, just for show, right? And agreements in relationships are often like that. Um, I don't know how you experience our agreements, but I, I experience them as um, far more helpful to me than any set of rules. Well, I do. And it just, as you were talking there, it just occurred to me. So agreements are based on the premise of personal accountability hey you agreed to this is a it's a it's a response to an to an action that entirely appeals to the person's own sense of personal accountability right because there are people who are like hey but you agreed to this like yeah, really, i don't care you know right. and and so but but, hey, but rules yeah apply to some like theoretical external framework of ramification or punishment or they tend penalty. to be abstract and they tend to be abstract and they tend to be applied um in this sort of flat way like here we're just going to apply this rule which is different from an agreement that tends to be more or at least the way we hold it tends to be more of a living agreement yes um it's hard to codify. well we talked about the genie it's really hard to codify a rule that would actually that captures everything right. that you actually intend, assuming you even figured out what you intend. <laughs> so let's get specific for a yeah. second and say, so a common rule that people who are new to um, ethical non-monogamy is um, you can you can touch, but you can't fall in love. Or you can do this, but you can't kiss. Or um, a common another common rule that I have heard in monogamy is... Um, you can talk, you can have friends, you can, you know, you have other relationships, that's all fine, but you can't be intimate, whatever that means. You know, I just want to say right off the bat that, I mean, it's easy to poke holes in those rules. Often yeah. the rules are in, um, 
the rules in ethical non-monogamy are often assumed to to from from people who aren't actively practicing a lot of times the rules are imagined to be designed to protect the couple so there's still this sort of hierarchy of the couple and i don't think that there's anything wrong with having a hierarchical polyamory if that's if that's your jam and in fact we do um we have a current agreement that that is that way because of well a bunch of things we can talk about that um but the idea that is baked in there the idea that the the original couple like the the couple who decides like we're a couple and we're going to be non-monogamous um the trap the trap that that is the trap that that can be for other people who are interacting with you yes. so the agreement there is we've decided that our marriage this isn't us but the 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 premise would be we've decided that our marriage comes first in all circumstances which means that at any point any other person who's interacting with this with either member of this couple could have a really intense specific and um easily met need that still falls below the priority of this abstract couple yep. as if the couplehood itself has its own set of rights um it's commonly called couples privilege when you're talking about non-monogamies and Even if you're practicing polyamory, I think it's an interesting concept to think about. Just question for yourself. What are we, what are we actually doing here? What is our agreement? And and I think it's really interesting that, yeah, so, so our, our agreements are, they're, they're part of our personal relationship and it's not the only way that this can happen, but the rules seem in my experience to be like you're accountable to the couplehood. Yes. Which isn't there there is no actual and there's no, individual in that couple. It's its own little creature out there. It's interesting that so that was my first experience of this was that somehow the couple that you were in was was primary to everything in, else. Including the two individuals needs who were in that couple right it's so uh, the marriage what well, the marriage had attained a, a status in all of our imaginations yep. that made it more important than the individual happiness or well-being of any of the three of us right which was it was something very very difficult to untangle yeah um resulted in a lot of hurt feelings and more divorce and more <laughs> more challenges yep. i so i don't want to this is not a top-down conversation. We're not saying we've figured this out and we know oh, no. how it all should work. Just but we have made some a, some experiences. We've had some big ouchy mistakes had. and some and some things that I'm not sure how you can walk out of them without pain. Um, I think we went about some of this in the most painful way possible, but not all of it. Um, I I've watched other people too go through the detangling of themselves, their individual self from the relationship and how they've come to make their agreements. And one of the big things that comes up is, were your agreements explicit or implicit? Um, I talk about this in the book Project Relationship, explicit versus implicit agreements. Most of us don't realize how much implicit agreement is in our relationship. And even I certainly didn't No, And I mean, I didn't realize how much the agreements were implicit. And by implicit, I specifically mean um, we never had conversations that outlined what we were agreeing to. Um, But there very definitely were expectations. So an implicit um, an implicit agreement to me is an expectation that has been unspoken Um, in our life. We have spoken agreements, but we also have written agreements. Um, and the written agreements to me are extremely helpful because they're they're like extra explicit. We took the time to write them down. Well, they, and they they survive the passage of time and the reevaluation and the reimagination of ideas after a bunch of other experiences have happened. Right, because of course memory is constructed, mm. right? So every yep. time we remember something, we are we're constructing it. it from. Yeah. Okay. So there's all the neurobiology to that, but. <laughs> I don't want to get That's... too lost in the weeds, but a written agreement does help us both. I think it helps us both put ourselves back into the mindset that we were in when we wrote it and at least reimagine like, oh, okay, here's what we thought we were going to do. Now, how is it actually playing out? 
But we don't make an explicit written agreement for everything. We have lots of explicit verbal agreements yep. where we talk and we we talk about how our relationship is going, but we also talk about what we each expect from our own lives, like our explicit agreements with ourselves. Yes. We try to make those visible to each other. Yeah. Um, you know, I so I have a tendency to go pretty big in um in dreaming up new businesses, new paths, new educational ventures. And those are all commitments I make to myself, but I also try to make them visible to you yes. by making them explicit. Which now, is that comes tremendously in, helpful. And that comes naturally to me. Yep. And it does not come naturally to me at all. So I was raised to believe that I could pretty much talk about anything I needed to talk about. And then I could ask for anything I needed to ask for. Um, I... It, and I did not. That said, so, I mean, you know, it's not like I, I also had a thick skin. Um, and I and, did not. And could, could hear no. My parents taught me to hear no um, very early and often. So, 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 so you and I come into this uh, relationship with very different um, standards of, of agreement. Yeah. Like how agreements are come to, yep. how, are brought, are, yeah, are I enacted. Have, I have found huge benefit in making as much explicit as possible between us. And one of the things that I've been impressed about with you is how explicit you are with yourself, I... which makes it possible to be explicit with me and with the kids and whoever else you've got relationships with. It's And so that, I mean, that works for my personality type. Yep. I have, I've said before, I'm an ENTJ and that's just using one. I'm also a, an Enneagram eight. I'm, I tend to be a very explicit, very challenging, like, and I will ch challenge myself. I'll put everything out there. You are I am different. an IFSP. And so I'm, I'm in the moment and I'm not talking about what I'm thinking. My thought processes such as they are, aren't visible. And most of them are feeling processes anyway, which I have trouble turning into words. And yeah. so it's more challenging, but oh my goodness, how, what the huge benefit I have found when I get past all that and actually say, this is what I would like. And it's, it and is fascinating because you, so you use your feelings far more than I do. So when you're able to codify that and get it out and, and talk about it and make it explicit, I always learn something like, I always learn something about myself. Oh yeah. I, I made my decisions through thinking through, through making like what I, what I imagined to be logical, rational decisions. They're not, but I imagined that they were, you come to them from a feeling place and you make your decisions from that place. And when I stop and allow my feelings to enter the picture and think about how my feelings are, I, I literally have to think about how my feelings feel. Yeah. Um, when I do that, I'm always amazed at how, how deep you go. So while you struggle to make some of this stuff explicit, you have felt it through very deeply which is a different kind of benefit. Yeah, the the our particular combination. Yeah, you think through to a level of detail that um often bewilders me. Like that's that's amazing. I I, I would don't, love to do But that. don't put it on a pedestal because it has its downsides. Well, no, I'm It's not cuz then you um you watch me feel my way through to a level of depth that you struggle to get to the two things combined are um when we can combine them it works it, it allows us to come up with agreements that can take a lot of things into account that that's not true otherwise. but it's taken a long time to realize that what what it takes to make an explicit agreement isn't just um like laying your proverbial cards on the table and then and then deciding the best path it's an unfolding process. Yes. Um, I think of our agreement around um, romance and intimacy is about, it, it has had to unfold and take into account how much hurt has happened in each of our lives yep. and our communication styles. You know, so I am an ask person. I will ask, but I also require people to ask for things. I deeply dislike having to guess what mm -hmm. people want. Um, 
and have because I was because I do I know how to do it. I'm good at it even. Um, but I resent it. Um, I resent having to read you are, people's you are good at it. Um, feelings. Like I don't mind doing it professionally. That's one thing. If I have somebody in a session and I'm reading, that's fine. But I resent it in a partnership. I resent having to pull, like, like pull all of the stuff out of you and and imagine into what you might want and then yeah. guess what it is you want. Yep. I don't like. That's very challenging for and me. From a yeah, I. There's much to be said there. Um, that's challenging for you. And it's challenging for me, it has been, to remember to be explicit in my asking. Right. And that I find that frustrating as, as you do, because it means a lot of times I don't get what I want because I have not asked for it. Right. And the agreements around our relationship um, actually, the thing is, talking about them in the in the imagination, like a, neither the one of us has to be situations. in a relationship, in a, you know, to have other relationships to yeah to talk about it. So we talk about it hypothetically, and the result is that later on, when something comes up, I don't have to reimagine and address the. We don't have to have the in-depth conversation for the first time about what we think is going to go on now right then. So we do some predi predictive, some predictive. Um, agreement and ne negotiation um, based on how how we we feel at the time. But so I think you're hitting on something important, which is that an agreement is it, it's alive. It, yes. it requires this sort of ongoing consent, it, ongoing consent. And it is befuddlingly easy for uh, an agreement to be used coercively it that yeah. it's a hard reality that sometimes you make an agreement and you're and then you need to renegotiate but the agreement itself can even get used so it's not as though an agreement is an explicit agreement doesn't have um its own ways of being weaponized yep. i just want to be clear that there's no there's no, there's no set of rules that protects us from any, any, you know, from feeling jealousy or from being bumped around by relationships or being hurt or abandoned or, or divorced from, or any, there is no set of rules yep. that really does that, but there's also no agreement that can perfectly, um, stay in sync with who you are as these two growing individuals yeah. or three or four growing individuals. And so as we've made relationship agreements because neither of us has had um i mean here we are in covid we haven't had yeah any any other romantic relationships during this time um <laughs> it is a lot of hypotheticals it is we, a lot we of spend some time talking through but there are other kinds of relationship there are friendships yeah. and there are um one of the most important pieces to agree upon is time expenditure. Yes. We, you know, people always ask me, how do you feel if he's having sex with someone else? And I'm like, uh, well, per this is probably more information that you want than you want, but turned on. I don't think that's the answer you were looking for. Um, but and, and the, <laughs> part of the answer also is it depends on what you're doing at the time. Okay. That's true. <laughs> but, but the real thing is how do you feel when he's spending time with someone else? Mm. And that definitely depends on what I'm doing at the time. There time is our most precious resource. Yeah. So time negotiations and the agreements about time, those get to me far more. I've had a lot of people come and say, okay, but I don't want him falling in love with someone else. I don't want them to feel the same way that, uh, about somebody else that they do about me. I think, well, I don't think you can control how someone else feels. And I don't think it's setting yourself up for for a happy and uh, satisfying experience to say, we'll just avoid that by making a rule that says you can't feel a certain way. But um, time, time isn't like, because we've decided to measure it in a certain way, we can measure time. We can measure how much time and how much money and how much, um, there are measurable things that we can that we can see being spent on someone else. So those I feel are actually agreements that you can get more crisp about. You can make 
some arrangements that are a little bit more they're quantifiable they're quantifiable yeah and sometimes the, the just the conversations about the things that you want to make an agreement about that's the conversation that yeah. lets you make a relationship that can handle all the stuff you can't actually quantify so having a conversation for instance about okay so i am going to be here for this person and if that means that i have to leave here in the middle of the night or that means that i have to go be away for two months i'm doing that I'm, i've made this this commitment my commitment is that that allows us to imagine into wow what is this new relationship and i mean the new relationship between you and i yes, what does it look right. like because we're reinventing it um so time for me is it's the most valuable conversation that we have for imagining what our agreements really are because it's just a it's all about the imagination it really is i have fallen in love three thousand miles away from somebody that's that's not that hard to do but then managing the the time and financial and and all the other all of those pieces those are practical they are practical and the 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 agreements that we make that we make in the whatever context we're in when we make them then yeah they they they're alive they're part of the relationship which is a, a constant back and forth and a an, an evaluation of what's happening right now and i've found the the verbal agreements very valuable as well as the written in times when things aren't going great between us so they're not rules so i don't feel the, like the bash of of a you know a, a hard wall what i feel is the connection of like that had us building this thing in the yeah, first place we we built it they agree oh okay yeah you say that the agreement holds within it the feelings we were feeling when we made it right and just revisiting the agreement in a moment when things are tricky between us exposes me to that feeling again right. and it can and it can it, be uncomfortable it can be uncomfortable oh, when i was feeling secure yeah i said that i was fine with you doing yeah. this or that yeah and, and it, now i'm feeling threatened or now i'm feeling weaker or now i'm feeling yeah. Um, vulnerable in my own way, or now I just feel tired, <laughs> right. or I'm hungry, or, I'm hungry. <laughs> or whatever. But as an IFSP who lives so much in the moment, and despite my constant efforts to reach out and in my body, so I'm in this moment where I'm having feelings about what you're doing, um, feelings about how things are going, and then I look at the agreement and I am able to stretch out past this moment into the other moments and our imagination of how things could go beyond my limited imagination of what the moment is right, right. now. Because we can have, we and we have had hurt feelings about how any particular time has to go, you know, Yeah. and then, but then the reason we've been able to do this for so many years is because we're not expecting it to be smooth. Yeah. It's yes. okay that it's bumpy. It's okay that it's bumpy. Um, we yeah. And that's one of the things we've agreed on. We've also agreed on things like, um, well, conversations about revisiting situations at certain intervals. But we've also agreed on exploring things together and then taking some breaks. Yes. Um, for ourselves or for each other. Uh, during the very beginning of our... Of our uh, <sighs> married life um i actually put on the table to you i was like you know what i'm not you haven't really ever had a, a monogamy commitment that was really explicit and committed monogamy that is really explicit and really has everything like laid out like this is my expectation is it its own kind of beautiful container and so i offered that to you it was a very sweet gesture and a very useful gift because you were right so we actually exchanged two sets of rings oh. at our wedding one was designed to be our wedding ring which i see you're wearing right now i'm not currently wearing mine oops <laughs> it actually doesn't fit right now that's funny. um but we also exchanged what we call our duck bands yep they have our our names and our date on them and we exchanged those and 
We only wear those when we are in a phase of having committed to monogamy for a period of time. And when I have done that, when we enter those phases, I don't feel, and we never do that if we are currently have, if we currently have committed relationships to other people, we don't just slip rings on. And that's not at no, all no, what no. I mean. I mean, like if we have entered a phase where we're like, you know what, let's, there's no one else in our life right now. Let's, let's do this it's for a It's a symbol bit. of an agreement that we agreement. put in place at a time when it makes sense and isn't just. Yeah, we wouldn't, yeah, not to be harmful to someone yeah. else. And, and that matters a lot to me because I was the third who, who felt yeah. like I, like I was like couples privilege was leveraged against me, but those rings allowed us to try this on and then to agree to take them off and set it aside again yeah. when we had explored that enough to know whether that was the right thing for our marriage. Right. Um, because, you know, we signed on the dotted line and there's a lot of assumption and I'm guessing a lot of people who are listening, you sign that marriage agreement and you are signing on to a set of not just like your state's rules around like <laughs> what what that means but also what the culture at large has told you each marriage means and i i call it the one rule to rule them all i had an interview with someone once and i was asking them about their monogamy agreement and she said, well, you know, the same one everybody has. Mm. And I said, well, tell me more about it. When did you have the conversation? When was the first time you talked about your monogamy agreement? She's like, well, I mean, you know, no, I, like, he just knows the rules. And I said, okay, so you have a set of rules? Well, yeah, you know, the rules. And it, it, we went around and around. Uh, the conversation got pretty intense um, because they got really incredulous that I, they thought I was trying to be, um, that I was being like, obtuse like intentionally obtuse and i really just meant i wanted to know what rules they had decided on but she imagined she really had imagined for herself that there was a set of rules out there that is commonly known and I, we call those cultural mores but in fact there are many you know we are, we actually live in a society of overlapping cultures and it's yeah. not just a unified whole the expectations we each enter into our marriage with are almost guaranteed to be different yes. even if you go to marriage counseling ahead of time it's still hard to get everything out on the table yeah. and well and then you hit a new experience and, and new or new parts of yourself new, become it, revealed yep. yeah i think that that for me was the the moment when i knew i wanted to commit myself actually to researching in this area and to continuing to live with you in a way that says yeah we're just going to keep renegotiating because the, the idea that there are these rules that can protect us, just it actually, un, it, that unsettles me. I, I am all for people setting boundaries, including the boundary of, I don't want to be with somebody who's non-monogamous. I have gone on dates with people before who thought they could handle it. I've gone on lots, probably most of the dates in my life are with people who meet me, know that I'm married and have children. They go on one to four dates with me and realize, nope, they can't handle that. They actually really do want a one-on-one -on -one committed monogamous relationship. It happens all the time. And I, I, I wind up discarded a lot. Um, and often will then get picked back up. Like they'll, they'll contact mm, me again yeah. when it, when they're, when they're not in a monogamous relationship. I decided that I wanted to try to be with people who had decided for themselves where like, if ethical non-monogamy if that's not part of the world you want to live in, that's fine, but know it and go ahead and say like, yeah, be, I don't want to be with somebody who's in that sort of arrangement because it's hard to be picked up and put down. Yeah. That's, that's painful. And I think that the, well, so you were, you started off talking about the, the different, um, so, social mores that people come into their, their marriages with and, though that diverges even more strongly when you have someone who has um a polyamorous viewpoint versus a monogamous viewpoint there's and there's a lot of opportunities to hurt each other when we don't take into account each other's point of view yeah so some of the ways that we have found just practically speaking of having great agreements in place are to set aside times to make our agreements yes to do our individual work 
we, you know, to each go to therapy, to each engage in a process. And we can talk about that further because I know you have a panicked look on your face. <laughs> um, a, our own processes <laughs> separately. Um, it, we have those pieces in place and that lets us come together to make agreements yeah. that work for us and work for our family. There is no one answer. No, definitely not. This is it's about a getting conversation. To know so if you have more questions about how this all works or other relationship related Something questions, we didn't cover, you can like email me at Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. And yeah, we'd love to hear from you. This, uh, this wraps up this little ethical non-monogamy centered um, set. And then we're going to pick up with our next topic in the next episode. But we'll revisit this um, as much as everybody's Absolutely. interested in. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Project Relationship Podcast with Dr. Jolie Hamilton and Ken Hamilton. If you're enjoying our conversation, we would be so grateful if you would drop a rating and quick review so more people will be able to find us. And if you have questions or suggestions that you of things you'd like us to tackle, please send an email to Jolie at JolieHamilton.com. I'd love to hear them. Project Relationship, the entrepreneur's action plan for passionate, sustainable love is available on Amazon in Kindle, soft or hardcover versions. This book is a succinct, practical guide to improving your love life. I wrote Project Relationship to give you a set of quick action tools and conversation guides that can transform a mediocre relationship into a fabulous one. These tools are based not just on what Jolie learned in her studies, but on what we actually do to make our relationship thrive. Until next time, remember, relationships can be messy, and that's good news. <laughs>